Holy crap. How are you guys doing today? Can you guys all hear me okay? Can you see the slide okay? All right, cool. Um, so yes, thank you guys so much for coming. This is a huge crowd and hopefully you guys aren't just here for the t-shirts, but you know, we'll make it worth your while if you sit through, you know, two hours of this stuff. Um, so yeah, the talk is everything is a plugin. Mastering Webpack from the inside out. Um, so I guess before we begin, just a little bit about myself. My name is Sean Larkin. I'm a UX developer at Mutual of Omaha Insurance Company in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm also a maintainer and kind of fit the role of developer advocate for the Webpack open source organization. Um, as you can see there, I'm also on the Angular CLI core team. And uh, I'm also just an evangelist for general open source sustainability. Um, who here just authors for open source? Kudos to you guys. That's awesome. So most people think Nebraska is like right around that area. <laughs> Who here actually knows where Nebraska is? Oh, oh wow, good. So you guys can say that's wrong. That's where it is. So that's, that's where I'm from. I live in Lincoln, Nebraska, but commute to Omaha. So about, a little bit about myself. I'm a technical support rep, kind of gone rogue. I got tired of not being able to solve people's problems. Um, and so instead, uh, you know, I decided to kind of try and teach myself how to program with the help of, you know, coworkers at the time. I uh, eventually learned Objective-C, uh, Ruby, Swift, and then JavaScript. And, you know, kind of fast forwarding to today, you know, it's almost full-time JavaScript and doing more open source and building contributors, communities, and ecosystems, you know, in open source. And so, you know, you guys feel free to pull out your phones or whatever. You can find me anywhere on these things at at the Lark Inn. A little play on words. But uh, go ahead, I'll, I'll let you tweet that if you guys would like to. Take your time. Take your time. Okay. May not be the answer to life, but. Now, if you guys want to ask me anything and you don't get a chance to talk to me, I mean, by all means, I love talking to people. Sometimes I talk too much. But if you want to, you know, ask me something another time, just go to the Larkin slash AMA on GitHub, and you can ask me whatever you like. Uh, you know, life, money, work, etc. And then I want to thank, um, I don't know if you follow our publication on Medium, but there's a booth out there uh, for AG Grid. And um, they've done something that no other organization so far has done besides to be partners with us. And so um, we are so grateful for their contributions to help support our open collective. Um, and it helps our contributors actually find some sort of gratification and compensation for the work that they do in our org. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is to ng-conf. So last year, for the first time ever, I got to speak uh, you know, at a conference. And um, I want to thank ng-conf for being able to give me uh, you know, a stage because a year ago today, I wasn't involved in Webpack. I had never even really used Webpack with Angular. That was my first workshop. And so um, I want to thank them for being able to not only you know, support my efforts in being involved, but everybody else's efforts who got to speak for the first time. And I encourage you guys to, uh, to also do the same and put yourself out there because anything's possible. You could end up, you know, maintaining a huge open source organization. So, a little round of applause for them. Whew, gets me a little emotional. Okay. So, everything is a plugin. Mastering Webpack from the inside out. So, uh, you know, how many here have actually, you know, how many here use Webpack? You know, I mean, that's awesome. How many here use, like, Grunt or Gulp? I mean, there's nothing to be ashamed about. That's awesome. Make files. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. We like that. Um, so, but we're going to talk about Webpack today. And, you know, uh, who here kind of understands the core concepts or has ever listened to a talk about the core concepts or been to our documentation? So, a good amount of you guys. So I think you guys are going to really get this talk. If you've never used Webpack for the first time, things may seem a little confusing, but I don't want that to discourage you. Because really, I'm not going to use those concepts at all in this talk. So <clears throat> the whole point 
um, you know, what we're going to do today is we're going we're gonna to walk a little bit through the source. I don't want to take it too deep. And then we're going to learn about a Webpack plugin anatomy and why it's so important and what it means to the Webpack ecosystem. And then you're just going to walk away with ultimate power. Well, or the ability to do anything you want, because that's what plugins obtain for our own library. It's what plugins do for your configuration. I mean, how many here use a Webpack plugin? If you use Webpack, you for sure use a, a plugin, at least one. <clears throat> And then the last thing, um, which is kind of near and dear to my heart, is that we want your help. Um, you know, we are an organization that is not backed by a company. We have sponsors, and we're extremely grateful for them because they use our software. But we are a product that is grassroots, started by one person in 2012, and then kind of taken under the arms of one React community, and then exploded in the Angular community over this year. And we are you guys. Everybody sitting here is our community, and so we want your help, and I want you to learn more about Webpack and become more comfortable with contributing, writing your own open source plugins, and really making our ecosystem rich and thriving. So, before we begin, though, we're going to learn a little bit about this thing called Tappable. So, who here knows what Tappable is? No? All right. Okay, so Tappable is a 200-line plugin library that is in the Webpack organization. So if you go to github.com uh, slash webpack slash tappable, uh, you're going to find this little 230-line library. But it is the backbone of our entire plugin system. Tappable, although small and packed with some power, it makes everything possible today that you know, is Webpack. And so you might be like, Sean, how does this work? Oh, I, you guys can't really see that. I could run over there and point at it, and so I think I'm going to. So, we have these classes in our source code that um, literally extend this library called Tappable. And what it allows them to do is use these functions called apply plugins. Who here uses Node and knows what event emitter is? Okay, oh, this is great. So Tappable is like event emitter. Right here is a event being emitted, and this is the event name, and this is the, uh, the second parameter, the, the rest of the parameters are state or information that's being passed through uh, to the plugin that's going to listen to it. And so, wh what? Okay, so here's just an example of a basic plugin. And so that same make hook is listening right there, and we have access to it, and we can perform functionality. So what you just saw, that's all, almost all of Webpack right there. And so here's a, a poorly drawn example, but I'll, I'll try and explain what's happening. It's the same thing that you just saw. So a plugin is registered uh, via compilers or compiler or compilation. We have lots of these instances. And then what happens is that uh, the apply function is called. And then it passes information to it. And then down over on the left-hand side, that's where your functionality becomes possible. So, what is a tappable instance? I'm going to say this a lot, and you know, it, hopefully it makes sense. But uh, a tappable instance is something that OK, so it's something you can plug into. Head nods, everything makes sense so far. This is good. This is good. Hey, thank you. <laughs> it's okay. I'm gonna run oh. Oh, I, I won't run as I won't run around as much. I'll I'll be good. Okay, so here's another little friendly diagram. And these are just two tappable instances that you might see uh, you know in the webpack source code. We have compiler and it returns a compilation, but how do you get to it? How do you get to it? You guys see something? Okay. All right, so you can kind of see an example there that those black puzzle pieces, I, I like to think of them as puzzle pieces. 
emit events that then return data that you can even plug into more. And so like what you're seeing here is compiler emits a compilation event and returns a compilation. You can plug into that and then all sorts of different hooks are going to be emitted from it. And different plugins, multiple plugins, hundreds of plugins can listen to these events and provide functionality. So I want to talk about these tappable instances. Now there's seven main ones that I don't want to get too crazy in depth about them. Um, because I want you guys to walk away feeling kind of comfortable and wanting to dive into the source more. Um, so compiler, what is it? I kind of think of it as the exode, oh, <laughs> I'm a bad speller. The ex it's, it's exposed via the Node API, so if you, who uses the Node API when they use Webpack? Cool, so you guys know you require Webpack and you get the compiler back. But it, I also like to consider it as like central dispatch because it handles and emits all events that are like, okay, we're gonna start, we're gonna stop, and Webpack failed, or there is a, you know, there's a file that changed, and so we're gonna rebundle, et cetera. And so it's kind of like the top level event emitter. And like I said, the Node API, here's an example. Const Webpack equals require Webpack. No, uh, you know, people who use the Node API, they're like, yeah. And then const compiler. That you know, is literally running Webpack right there and you pass your configuration in. And then the next one is gonna be called the compilation. So uh, there's so much that happens in the compilation, but I like to sum it up as the dependency graph. It is the meat, it is all the juicy goodness of what is happening behind the scenes with your source files. Yeah. Uh, I also like to call it the brain because there is so many uh, intelligent things that are happening. Code is being moved around, it's being split into different files and chunks, things are being mapped and resolved and uh, uh, added and fit into the right place. Um, and it's created by the compiler. You actually have to plug into the compiler to get to the compilation. And it contains all the, the dependency graph traversal algorithms or it has the code that lets you walk the graph of all of your files and stitch them together. And then we have the resolver. The resolver. Or the bloodhound. I don't know why I called it the bloodhound at the time, but <laughs> the easiest way to describe it is that it finds your files. Everything in Webpack has a very specific purpose and we designed it this way so that at any time, let's say something crazy happens or in the ecosystem like Come on, like a year in JavaScript is like 100 JavaScript years. And we know that, right? <laughs> and so we have wanted to have a way to be able to just pop something out and put something new back in. And so the resolver, in the same way, has a single function. It is provided a file, like, or a path to a file. Let's say your entry point or, you know, a dependency of an entry point. And the resolver goes off and looks for it. And then what it returns, if it finds the file, is some additional information that it's gonna be used to actually create that file in memory. And so, <clears throat> you know, you might be wondering, well, this is a tap of instance, you can plug into it. It's already plugged into a whole bunch, as you can see here. We, uh, the resolver sits on top of the normal uh, node um, module resolution pattern, I guess you could say. But we have all these extra features to also help you load resolvers and, uh, or I'm sorry, to resolve loaders as well as uh, different types of plugins, etc. And this is in a separate library called Enhanced Resolve. So let's say like, Sean, I, you know, I don't care. Or Sean, I really want to know more about this feature only. Well, we actually have it in a separate uh, repository. So webpack slash enhanced resolve. The module factories. I I've lost count, maybe four or five, the uh, fifth one. So what are module factories? I mean, how, I mean like, uh, we're used to the term factories in Angular land, right? I mean, we, we, this kind of makes sense. So, a module factory takes a successfully resolved resource or a file or request, and then it's actually gonna collect the source for it, and it creates a module object. We have, uh, you know, the source code in Webpack is very object oriented. And so um, if you look at it, you're gonna be like, what are all these classes? Module is gonna be one of those. 
So what happens is that that extra information that we got from the resolver, it's going to go through this factory. And it's actually going to return a module object. And it's so beautiful. Look at that. It's shiny. <laughs> OK. The parser. I can has ASTs. Who here knows what an abstract, or abstract syntax tree is? Awesome. So for those of you who don't, um, it's hard to work with just strings. Like, have you ever tried to replace a file with regex and like, manipulate it? Well, it's easier to traverse and, and understand the bits of code when you have an AST, which is a tree of all the symbols and parts of your code broken out. And so the parser parses. It creates an AST of that module object. And it walks through it looking for very specific things. It looks for all, I'm going to call them dependency statements. Because I think it's more than just require and import. It's export, it's require ensure, it's AMD requires, it's require JS requires. We support all those things, and so we need to know what those tokens are and where they exist, and if they exist on a certain module. So it finds all of those, and it creates dependencies, because those statements are dependencies of the file that you're in, right? Cool. So, you know, another example, you pass the module in, comes from the module factory, and it goes through the parser. We're, we're scanning for requires and imports. And boom, we have dependencies now that are inside of our module object. Does this make sense so far? Little head nods? Yes. OK, good. And then the final one is the template. Template? So you can think of a template. I mean, we all use templates, Angular templates, right? What, what is the purpose of Angular templates? It's to take the state or the data or the information that you have inside of controllers or your files, and it, is, it allows you to bind it so that it can be displayed, right? That is the exact purpose of the template instance inside of Webpack. It actually creates or is responsible for creating the code you actually see when Webpack outputs a bundle. How does that work? OK, so fast forward just a little bit. Obviously, our code is usually not one module. But each of them are going to have their own unique dependencies. And we're going to shove them in this container called a chunk. I mean, we, we kind of know what chunks are, right? They're just portions of your dependency graph. And so we're going to run them through templates. But there is a template for every kind of abstraction that we have. So we have dependency templates. We have module templates and chunk templates. And even for the Webpack Bootstrap code, we have what's called the main template. And so we pass the data that we have in memory. And boom, we have a bundle. We have written code you know, out to you know, wherever your output file is. This is kind of just a pseudo example, but that's kind of what your code looks like. Every, every, chunk, or every module in your bundle is actually a function that's wrapped around your individual source code. And so that's your module template rendering. And these are your dependency templates, which convert import into a webpack require. So oh my gosh, you guys just learned the entire process of webpack behind the scenes. And so we'll stitch it together. The compiler, it reads options and then creates you a compilation. And we're into the meat now. That compilation is going to read the entry property and it's going to send it through the normal module factory into your resolver. Because we need to know if this file exists. And when it does, it's actually going to send it back out. And on its way, it's going to create a module object with the source inside. But we can't just put imports and stuff into, you know, we can't just throw that in there. We need to know about our dependencies. And so it's going to go through the parser. If it's not JavaScript, loaders are going to transform it to JavaScript. But eventually, it gets to the parser, and we're going to create and know about the dependencies in each module that gets parsed. And then what, what are we going to do? We're going to repeat the entire process for every dependency also 
Those become modules. They are new nodes on your dependency graph. And it, recur it recurses until you have an entire graph. So you just learned Webpack behind the scenes entirely. That's the entire process. <laughs> now, <laughs> so I don't know, if you follow me on Twitter, um, this has been kind of a labor of love and passion for me because so often I did not understand this stuff six months ago. And so what has helped me so much is to create these stories and understandings about how each part works in Webpack. Because when you know, you unlock so much power in being able to customize it to make it your own. So we, you know, I'm not going to make you read that. I don't, don't worry. Uh, so, hey, I'm a module. I cannot wait to be in the browser. Neither can we. Hold on there. Hold on. You got cooler jets. We need to get you into shape. So we need to do some things first. Oh, there we go. And this is the render portion. We're going to have you jump into this container called a chunk. And we're going to actually optimize the crap out of you with some plugins. Huh, funny, right? Plugins. Uh, and at the end, we don't want to lose track of you. We want to keep some information. So you're going to stay in that chunk. We're going to get some IDs out of you. All right, when we're done, we still can't let you send those import and require statements because those just fail in the browser. So we, need, we have special instructions created by our parser to convert you into something that the browser can understand. Dependency templates and the dependency factory, or module factory. Oh my gosh, that looks so familiar, guys. I'm finally rendered. Browser land, here we come. So that is the entire life cycle of Webpack. Does that make sense? I want, just, I want you to be honest, because I'm actually going to save a crap ton of time for questions. Who here, did this make sense? Awesome. OK. So why should I care? Who cares, Sean? I'm just writing web apps. You may not be as passionate as me about Webpack, I understand. But this enables you to do more and look in the source, have better debugging capabilities. And on top of that, every one of those things in the life cycle that you just saw can be plugged into and customized. So, for example, let's just jump back. Right here, you see that little thing that says before resolve? Let's say you want to instead swap that out for a different file request. Well, you can plug into the before resolve hook and pass a completely separate file. So environment switching, hey, how nice does that sound? It's as simple as writing a plugin for the normal module factory. That's just one example. So. Here's this, this is kind of fun time where I'm going to, I literally want you guys to ask me questions first. Because what we're going to do next is I'm going to take, we're going to, you know, pop out our laptops and we're going to learn how to write a few plugins. So, so far, who wants to ask questions? <laughs> oh, I wasn't going to ask a question at first, but, okay, yeah, yes, who raised their hand? And do I have a microphone that I can throw at somebody? Maybe, yes. I'll just come up. OK, what's your question? So having worked with Webpack, is there, and you go through that saying that it's all kind of event-based. Mm -hmm. So is the entire process asynchronous, or are your plugins processed asynchronously? Oh, that's a really great question, actually. Yeah, I will definitely repeat it. So the question is, the question was, seeing that everything in Webpack is event-based, does that mean that these events, that everything in Webpack is asynchronous or synchronous? 
And so the question, or the answer is, it's a mixture. If you, uh, you know, I would pull up the repository, but I'm too excited to hand out these t-shirts. Um, you know, the thing is, is that, no, uh, we actually provide a variety of different ways to call plugins and ap apply them. And so we have what's called async. We have a waterfall style, which is meant for our resolver to do like a try and next, try next, try next. But we also have synchronous and asynchronous. It is too, uh, it would be too inflexible not to be able to have different types of ways to have plugins execute their functionality. And we'll look at some of that as we actually dive into uh, the plugins themselves. Yeah, so that's a good question. So when you use a plugin in your configuration, um, there, it will execute from top to bottom, but it all is based on the order of those hooks. Some things will execute sooner and some will execute later. Next question. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was, when it comes to like SAS compilation, um, and in, in specifically regarding different, uh, you know, handling different components and different files, uh, is there flexibility? Can you do this with plugins? You can. You can. And so as you saw there, at every single point, we know about every module that is being loaded. And at, there is a hook that will let you plug into every moment that you access a module. So that means you could collect every single SAS file before it gets converted to loaders. Or you can take a look at you know, a bundle or things that are added to a chunk and just scan a chunk worth of all of your modules. And so really, any, and when I say anything's possible, it totally is. If it's an asynchronous process, you can even do it asynchronously if you'd like. Let's see. Uh, I want to be fair to the middle. This gentleman right here. So I think that that's actually, that's a really great question. Would you, how do you recommend I start out, Sean, with Webpack? Do we start out with the CLI or should we just go, you know, should we just roll our own? I would say use the Webpack CLI first and eject it. Be comfortable with using, you know, Webpack, be, you know, with as kind of an underlying layer. And then as, let's say if your app becomes more complex, Let's say if you have custom use cases or things that you really need to fit into your workflow, go ahead and eject it and see how myself and the CLI team have set up the best practices to use Webpack with Angular. And who knows, there may be some advanced optimizations. I can think of a few just remembering it. Uh, hold on one second. I want to find a lady who has a question. If you have, no pressure. There's no pressure. Okay, who else has a question? Raise your hands again. Okay, yes. Oh, don't worry. You won't, you won't not get a t-shirt. Yes, you. That's a great question. So yeah, I'll try to boil it down. It won't be verbatim. Huh. Close. There we go. The question was, so every time, you know, somebody shares their Webpack config, people are like, ah, and it's kind of scary. Um, the thing is that every application is a beautiful, special, unique snowflake, and we can't avoid that. We can't avoid that. We all know that. And so, you know, the answer, you know, the answer that I would give you for how do you reason, how do you reason with being able to make it more readable? Um, you know, th that's one of the, I guess, daggers for our configuration is code. It's a module that's exported and it's read by the compiler. Um, you know, I would say that try to find a way to, like, 
take your own in-house code best practices and apply them to your Webpack configuration. Some people even use TypeScript files as their Webpack configurations. It's possible, it's doable. As long as you have a TypeScript loader, you can use a webpack.config.ts and it'll work. Uh, I've found that there's something really valuable to being able to have maybe a little bit of typing on top of it that can help not only somebody navigate or configure or change, but also just kind of reading it in general. More questions? Yes? I'm sorry? Oh, for building, oh, yeah, so the question is, mm, good question. What is the process for building the Webpack source code? Oh. So um, you can, if you want to actually build it yourself, it's not terrible at all. Um, the thing is, is that our code isn't transpiled or it is raw JavaScript as you see it. And so um, to build it, it's as simple as checking out the repository, cloning it, and running yarn or npm install, whatever you, we recommend yarn and then running npm link, and then npm link webpack. And so that lets you run tests, et cetera. But good question. Yes, Wesley. Yeah, uh, I had a question about, because I noticed that when looking at webpack plugins, yes. uh, the API, because it's a vendor, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a yes. callback. You can. Mm -hmm. Yes. It is on my heart night and day. So I'll tell you what he said. Um, so when you guys saw how a plugin is structured and what the anatomy is, it's event-based. And as we know with ES5, ES6 event-based code, you're going to end up with the callback hell. And um, although it doesn't really bother me too much, um, I agree that we really need to have a better way to make it easier to create plugins and for people to customize this process. Um, so yes, there kind of is, but now for the record, there's nothing wrong with actually using promises in your, own, in your own plugin. If you actually look at the source code for HTML Webpack plugin, probably one of our most popular third party, you can see that, um, uh, I can't remember his last name, but on GitHub he's the Entomon. Uh, he uses promises all throughout to simplify the, you know, organizing how async code processes throughout. And so you can build a pre-transpiled ES6 with all the bells and whistle, whistles plugin, as long as you just make sure that you're shipping a uh, compiled version down. Yes? Factories? Okay. And we can, oh, sorry, feedback. Woo! Hot mic. Um, yeah, so there has to be a process to, when you saw how the resolver works, and I'll, I'll ask the, or I'll say the question, he says, factories feel like a black box to me. Well, a factory's responsibility, oh my gosh, is to return, is to create something. And so a module factory is going to create a module in memory. So like I said, Webpack's source code uh, has, <clears throat> is very object oriented and so everything that we represent in the code is going to be object oriented as well. So a module, everything in Webpack is a module, whether it's CSS or JavaScript and so we have to abstract that. And so what happens is that we use uh, the module factory to create this abstraction and an instance of what's called a module. And so that factory literally takes the information it receives from the resolver and creates a module. And you can see a little bit more of it when we dive into actually creating custom plugins. How much time did I, oh wow, so much time. Okay, so who else has questions? Yes. Of course. Um, just, you know, because the support behind them isn't mm -hmm. uh, robust enough. Yes. Are those issues that are also potentially present in Webpack? And how can, you know, what, what, what is the, the 
That is a really good question. So, and, and, and honestly, a really great concern for a lot of people who use Webpack. They say, or, so the question was, we use Grunt and we're encouraged to use Grunt um, as a task runner, and a lot of the plugins uh, you know, are either obsolete or out of date. Who has experienced that before? Welcome to, to the JavaScript renaissance. Lots of new things being created. Um, are we going to have that same issue with Webpack? Uh, you know, maybe two months ago, I would say maybe. Um, but we actually created an entire new organization called Webpack Contrib. So if you go to GitHub right now and you try to find any of our loaders or plugins, they're actually in a separate organization called Webpack Contrib. And the reason we did that is because we've built our contributor base up and we realized, like as a core team, we're like, we cannot manage this many loaders and plugins ourselves. And so we gave some extra responsibility to um, a few people uh, who have been, you know, who've been kind of with us along the way through the rocky roads to Webpack 2. And they're now the maintainers and are in charge of Webpack Contrib. And so the first thing that we did is we decided we need to standardize across the board. We cannot allow anybody to have a crappy experience just because they updated to Webpack 2 or because they decide to, you know, somebody published a breaking change, we're not going to allow that. We can't allow that. We're being built by 90% of the React community. And now here, we're going to be built by 75 to 80% of the React community. And so you put your trust in us. And so we want to be able to provide the infrastructure. And that's another way for people to get involved. So uh, thank you. That's a really good question. And by the way, if you don't, Get a shirt that fits. That's OK. I have a surprise for you afterwards. <laughs> um, yes, back there. Yes, you. Oh, yes, I love that question. So Sean, how do I debug a webpack? If something goes wrong and all these fancy terminologies that you've used in these instances, how do I know what's going wrong? How can I find out? Um, so when we break out the laptops and we decide to write a couple plugins here in just a moment, um, I'm going to show you a quick command that I use that I built into the repository. Um, but the best way is by using node debugger and like Chrome inspect. Or if you're a VS Code user like myself, you can actually just do that right from, right from the editor. But the best way, and it's even one of my favorite ways to write plugins. Because as you know, if you've ever looked at our source code, it is just pure, unadulterated ES5 and ES6 code. And so there are no types, I'm sorry. Um, and so it's not the easiest to understand what am I getting back from these events. And so using breakpoints and using debuggers and console logs, they're like the best way to go about it. And I encourage the same way when you come across a bug or an issue, even if it's just an error in your configuration, you're not even writing a plugin. That kind of information is so valuable to us, especially if it's a Webpack bug, which there definitely might be one. Oh, let's see. I'm going to try and get it accurate. OK. So I should go to this side now because I've been so one sided. Yes. What's coming up in the next version of Webpack? So we have two very, 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 very important things that are near and dear to us. So you probably heard a bajillion times, Sean, uh, you know, why can't I tree shake as well as I can? Well, the reason why is because, as you saw in those module templates, we create little wrappers around every single file and each dependency that's created as a module. And so it is less efficient and it's a little bit of overhead in comparison to like a library bundler like Rollup to have all of that in separate scopes. And so we understand that. And the features that we're going to bring, one of the most important is the ability to hoist all of that into one function. The JavaScript engine loves this. And on top of that, um, you have a way quicker startup time. And so that's one of the things that, that's number one priority. Um, if you go to webpack.js.org and you go to slash vote, you can actually see what the community has decided for us that we're going to be working on. So the second thing, who here knows what WebAssembly is? Oh, wow. Nice, guys. I'm excited to use it as well. So we believe that WebAssembly is the future. 
And, but we also believe that it needs a better path for users to be able to use it. There is no reason why you and you and you and you and you, any of us should not be able to use WebAssembly with ease. And so what we are planning on doing, and I, I have to submit the grant here as of probably um, next week, is that we are submitting a grant request to the Mozilla Open Source Foundation to work on first class module support for WebAssembly. What does that mean, Sean? Oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's super exciting, I get chills. I, they're chills. Um, so what does this mean? Well, you should just be able to import git prime numbers from git primes.rust, git primes.c++, git primes.c. You should never have to worry about anything else and it should just work like JavaScript, hands down. So you should have the inherent benefits and that, those are the two most important features that we were working on. So who, who asked that again? Sorry, I got lost in passion. Okay, so I think I'll take two more questions because you guys should, you guys want a code, I get it. Um, or you just want a t-shirt. Uh, yes. So how can we help? How can we, oh, I'll, I'll give this to you. How can we help, he said. Just wait till the end of the talk. Um, um, oh, there's so many people. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, you guys have gotten way too many t-shirts from me. I want the person in the far back at the very back. Hello, you. Yes, you in the blue shirt. What's your question? So I was talking about the plugin. Is there a mechanism for fixtures for doing tests so that we can wrap those plugins and test what we're building? Totally. Um, yes, that's a great question. That's an awesome question. So, Sean, we, I want to make a plugin. Is there tests and fixtures and things that we can use? to make verifying that you know, our functionality works and this is, you know, we're doing it the right way. And the answer is yes. So one of the, my favorite parts of Webpack Contrib is a project called Webpack Defaults. So it may not be your preference, but uh, we have essentially standards that we apply across the board for all loaders and plugins. And because of that, we want to be able to also extend those defaults to you. So if you create a new plugin and loader and you want it to be a part of our organization and live in the glory of Webpack and Trib, you can just use Webpack defaults, npm install Webpack defaults, and then I think you run it as an npm command. And it automatically adds the entire fixtures, dot files, and configurations that you need to have a Webpack ready and verified by our contrib team, uh, you know, set up to be able to start writing. So, I think, I think those are all, I, you guys should want to code. So let's, let's, let's play some plugins. Okay, so what I want you guys to do is jump to, oh wait, I have a slide here still. Got ahead of myself. I'm gonna give you just a moment. Go ahead and clone this repo. Uh, GitHub.com slash the lark in with two N's slash everything is a plugin. So I'll give you just a moment. I guess I could take more questions if people have it. But if you like got a laptop, go start NPM installing first. Okay, you sir. Why are they what? Uh, there's two different types. So, uh, okay, I'll. I'll I'll, I'll try and answer the question to the best of my abilities. So the question is, so if you look in the Angular CLI source code, why, Sean, is the Webpack configuration set up to, uh, set up to add CSS files uh, into the JavaScript? Now, as, so I will ashamedly admit something, and that is in six months, I have not contributed to the CLI since Webpack 2 was released. So. I have a uh, lot, you know, you can only balance so much, and so Webpack, I, I, I favored over Angular CLI. Um, but I can tell you that when we initially set it up, we designed it so that in our development environment, styles should be loaded into JS. And why? Well, when you use style loader, behind the scenes, every style that is loaded into JavaScript and then they slap a script tag on the browser is actually 
uh, has a hot.module.accept wrapped around it so that you can uh, do hot module replacement for all your styles out of the box. Did I give you a shirt? Okay, 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 okay. Um, all right, so, now, so follow these instructions. How many people are actually ready? Who are, who's still working on this? Raise your hand. Okay, 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 we have a moment. Um, next question. Want to be... So I'm looking for people in the middle. Oh, if you stay to the end, I promise I got a treat for you. All right. Yes, sir. What's your question? My question is, at the beginning, you asked who uses Gulp. Yes. And so is it a bad practice to use Webpack to move files around or do actions like that? Because I've seen that people treat them as bundles and they just copy them. That's a good question. So somebody asks, hey, Sean, you know, we use Gulp, which there's nothing wrong with. It's a great task runner. Um, but we also use Webpack. Is there anything wrong with using Webpack to move files around? Now, I guess it, it really depends on the context, but to me, um, you can do so. Uh, there are some plugins which I always say, you know, maybe you don't use as much because you want to have everything processed through Webpack. It doesn't all have to be bundled together, but it can be processed. Um, but yeah, there's like copy webpack plugin, which will move things around. And you can look at that source code when we're done. You're going to be like, I get how this works. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. All right, so just a little primer to jumping in. There are three commands that I have, you know, already fashioned for you or uh, created, crafted. We're artisans, aren't we? So there is npm run build, and that's just going to run Webpack with some fancy stats. There's also going to be npm run dev, and that just runs Webpack dev server. It might not be 100% needed. Um, I, I like using npm run build for right now because we're going to have to stop and rebuild and check out a new git tag, etc. And then that one that you might be interested in is npm run debug. So we're going to actually set some breakpoints and learn how to inspect this code. Because part of writing code is also, you know, is debugging it. So now I think we're ready. OK. So let me just make sure that I am in the same. OK, so who cannot see that? Uh, OK, let's, how about now? How about now? Better-ish? OK. I, that person in the extremely far back, I don't know how much larger I can make it before it is like, point, like 40 point font. Okay, so let's just take an overview of the project really quick. And this is just a learning repository. There are a lot of git tags in here. And as I was authoring it, this is the first time I've ever really written a guided walkthrough with you know, git, git tags and moving around. Uh, so there may be a couple tags that don't really change anything. So I apologize. Uh, but you can always kind of see what the full list is just by running git tag. And you can see here that there are quite a few. And so we're going to go uh, 1, 0 to 1, 3. And we're going to do an answer and a quiz. And then we're going to really kind of stay a bit more high level from 2, from 2, 0 to 2, 3 to 3, 0. And then four and five if you guys are really feeling courageous. Um, so let's get started. Who, who's all ready? Awesome, guys. First of all, thank you for, for staying with me this far. It'll be worth the while. So right here, what we see is an example of the simplest plugin that you can imagine. The way that the conventions that we like to prescribe for Webpack plugins are that they're an object that contains an apply property. Um, in, in our terminology that you see here, it's a class that has an apply method. So uh, it also has a constructor which provides options. So if you wanted to pass an option into your plugin and use that option from your configuration, you're going to pass it as the uh, constructor arguments. And so you're going to actually find a little, uh, a little lib, <laughs> a little require statement for plugin utils. This is just a very, um, a very basic banner printing with chalk. 
So it's just so that you can see, the way that I always found learning Webpack was that if I could just go ahead and plug into a bunch of hooks and console log the crap out of it, it would make so much more sense in understanding the life cycle. So I've created one for you that's kind of beautiful, and you can add like BG and a color and then the font color, but I think this is good enough to start with. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. Awesome! So Webpack ran, and we have some files that are in our actual source, and we'll, we'll look at them for a moment. But we get an event, we didn't even plug into anything, Sean. That's right, because we actually were console logging in the constructor when the plugin is actually registered onto the compiler. So you might say, like, how did that happen? Well, if we look at our configuration here, we are using that plugin and that it is applied to the plugins array. Yes. Oh, sorry, let's start at git tag 1.0. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so yeah, because I think it checks out 5. So if you haven't already, just do git checkout 1.0. Git checkout 1.0. Boom. All right. And so let's just take a look and look at some of the sources here. I've created a variety of different files and how they're used. But here is our entry point. If you're like, why would anybody do this? It doesn't matter. But we have um, some import, using some Harmony imports or ES6 imports at the top. But then we're also lazy loading some. Yes, you could use promise.all. Uh, I just chose to use this. Um, we're just console logging you know, the modules if we were to run this in the browser. So we have dynamic, uh, or I guess you could say lazy loaded modules, and we also have just ES6 modules. And each of these are just like exporting a string. Nothing fancy. And then we also have the plugin itself, an index file which exports that plugin to make it available inside of your Webpack configuration. And the only rule is that if it's a class, you need to create a new instance of it, and so we're gonna call new one one basic plugin, Webpack plugin. <laughs> so let's take a look at it again. I'll just let you guys have a chance to actually just do npm run build. Yes. Yes, yeah, so the, the, it's the plugin that's inside of the plugin lessons plugin <laughs> folder. Oh, yeah, so like if you look in the, the export file, I didn't want to use numbers and so, uh, I actually just gave it an export that's slightly different named. Yep. So when we run it, we obviously Webpack compiling files as normal, but then we also see this beautiful banner that has been crafted from, you know, the comment. But what is happening behind the scenes? Can we debug into this process? Yes, you can. So why don't we jump into the actual plugin itself that is authored, and we can go ahead and just add a debugger statement. Will this work? I don't know. So add a debugger and save. And then really quickly, I want you to open up Chrome. If you have Chrome, hopefully you guys have Chrome. And we're gonna run uh, Chrome inspect. I'll give you a moment to type that in. You're gonna see some very interesting things here. It, you see a open, dedicated, Dev tools for Node. Very cool. Hmm. Uh, well, we haven't ran anything yet. We're getting there. We just added a debugger to the plugin itself. So nothing's happening in this window, but we want to jump back over to our our Webpack plugin that we have here. Like I said, it's just a class that has a constructor, and we've put a debugger in the bottom of that constructor. Fair enough. So now, why don't we run npm run debug? Oh, look at that. And so now we've actually dove into the node process. We have questions in the back. So I typed in the URL, chrome colon slash slash inspect. 
And you should see a link that says open dedicated node debugger. Do you want me to go with one? Yeah, that would be incredible. If, the, if you do not see it, you might need latest Chrome. And if you don't at all, that is still OK. Because if you look in your terminal, you're actually going to see a URL that is output from running that command. You can go ahead and paste that URL into the browser. Raise your hand if you have a question so I can bring you a mic. For sure. So hopefully you should be at some point right here. And if you're not, yes, raise your hand. We want to help. Or I'll come over. I want to give everybody a moment to, you know, to experience this. You're probably learning five new things right now. Huh. Yes. Sorry, this is maybe a dumb question, but I'm getting like I can't find the module. Everything is a plug-in dollar npm something. Oh, I something, see. Something. Okay, so it is probably a Windows thing. <laughs> Let's go ahead and so all this is trying to do is run the the Webpack uh, binary executable. So I just did npm bin. So if you don't have, who is on a Windows computer? All right, all right. So um, let's take a look at the command, and I'll try and help everybody at once. And if it doesn't work, literally, I'll spend time on my Surface Book, and we'll figure it out together afterwards. Ugh. OK, so <laughs> let's take a look at that package.json where this command is ran. And so uh, what I'm doing here is actually node dash dash inspect dash dash debug brk. So that brk just means stop on the first line, so don't continue. And then this is a little bash shorthand. Oh, I failed. I failed. I'm sorry. So we could do this. We could do this. Uh, git bash? Would it be like this, like? Uh, okay, okay. We could also just point towards the binary command. So an, another option is this. We can just say node modules slash webpack slash bin slash webpack.js. So how many people have a breakpoint stopped? OK, that's pretty good. Anybody who is still having issues, I will spend time with you afterwards. And we'll get it working. And more Windows people, you guys need to show me how to do this on my Surface Book. Because I, I, use, I use the Linux subsystem. So, uh, OK, awesome. So let's, let's see what we have here. So we have, this just stops on the first file, the executable. This is the binary executable for Webpack. Uh, bin slash webpack.js. And so we have a debugger, so we should be able to hit play at the top right. And it's going to take us all the way down to the debugger statement. Hey! We can literally debug any part of our plugin. And that's our plugin right there. It works for Windows? Yes. Awesome, guys. Thank you for the help. So why don't, why don't we see what's available in our scope? This is one of the, my favorite things to do while uh, in, this, in this debugger. So like anybody, you guys have all used Chrome Inspector and debugger in your normal web apps, right? It's almost identical. Um, so we can just look in the global scope and see what there is. We have our constructor. We're in the class scope. We have plugin utils available to us. And then just the global Node.js scope. So let's go ahead and take this a little bit more serious. So that now that we kind of understand, <coughs> let's jump to lesson 1.1. And if you fall behind, so I'm going to have a quiz and an answer section. And during that time, if you feel like you've gotten lost, you can come pull me uh, you know, over there, and I can help you no matter what. All right, so let's go ahead and just do Git checkout 1.1. Oh, let's reset our changes. OK. All right, so we're at 1.1 now. 
Let's see what we have here. I'm gonna close this file and reopen it. Oh, exciting. So hopefully you all can kind of see here. This live coding is the first time I've ever done this, so thanks for being patient with me. Um, don't, tell, don't ever tell them it's your first time. Okay. So we still have our, our little logging event inside of our, our constructor, but now we've actually hooked into a piece of the Webpack lifecycle. So what do we have here? What are we seeing? We have two, uh, two plugin hooks, and they are slightly different, but they accomplish the same thing, and I'll tell you why. So, would you like to run it first, or do you, wanna, you want me to explain it first? Run it first, explain it first. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, cool. So I'm gonna explain it. So to create a Webpack plugin and to listen to an event, so you're going to actually use the argument that you get in your apply function. So you see compiler here? Yes? Well, this is the compiler instance that we talked about, the top level emitting events, and it's how you dive deeper into the life cycle. So that is your compiler. That's the compiler that you use when you're in the Node API. So yes, you could technically plug into hooks in the Node API without even writing a plugin. So the syntax is seen right here. Dot plugin, so that's like your node event, or your uh, event emitter dot on. So dot plugin, and then you want to listen to the run event. And then you have a callback. You're going to get some information inside of it. You're going to actually get that same compiler instance. And then you're going to have a callback function because this is an async plugin hook. And inside of here, what are we doing? We're just, we're setting a message and we are going to console log it. And then we tell Webpack, hey, we're done with this step. So go ahead and continue, you know, any process. And then down here, we're actually plugging into the watch run hook. So could you maybe guess the difference between run and watch run? Correct, one is in watch mode. So we actually get to run Webpack run dev, or NPM run dev or NPM run build. So let's, let's go ahead and try and run our newly created commands here that we've plugged into. So NPM run build. Whoa. Hey, look. Hello world. Ooh, that's ugly. Ah, oh, there we go. Hello world. That is our little, you know, we're just taking it easy at first. So now let's do the same thing, but you know, cause we plugged in twice, but we only saw one. So let's do NPM run dev. Hey, we're in watch mode, but look, we also have the same thing. Uh, watch run. So wait, why don't we find out? Let's make sure, yeah, he's fat, he's like, are you sure, is that just the other plugin? Well, let's prove it. And you guys can go ahead and put in a custom message or whatever you'd like to. Hello world, from this is build I promise. And hello world from this is watch I told you so. If this isn't irrefutable then I don't know. This is build, I promise, okay. Just in case you really wanna see it. Hey, this is watch, I told you so. Beautiful. So you're like, Sean, that's so cumbersome to have to plug into both. Well, my friends, let me tell you, you can actually pass an array of events as that, you know, as your event. And Webpack will listen to both of them. I'm sorry? Oh, watch is, so anytime that Webpack is in watch mode, so Webpack dev server, or if you use the watch flag to do incremental building. So it's a slightly separate uh, process. It's actually a different tappable instance. 
And so uh, it's called watching instead of, it's like the watching compiler instead of just the compiler. Yes? You can. Yeah, absolutely, because there's a thousand plugins that are plugging into all sorts of events at one time. So like, you'll see here that this is in watch, watch run twice. And we'll have two, we should technically see both of these console logs. Let's give it a try. Whoa! How about it? And this is the process, this is kind of one of those magical processes of Webpack is that we're just emitting events and then plugins are building the functionality around the entire system. Yes? I'm sorry? What is the role? So this is an asynchronous, uh, question was, what is the role of the callback function? So uh, this is an asynchronous hook, and um, what you'll see in the source code, and I'll, I'll actually share some snippets uh, near the end if we still have time, which we definitely will, um, is that, remember in the slide where I said what inside of the compiler code this may look like, apply plugins async, and then the event, and then some state that it wants to pass, and then a function that is gonna be executed after this occurs. So that second, that last parameter, that's what you're calling from inside your plugin, and that's the callback. So like it might look like, we call it, or function callback. Does that make sense? Maybe kind of, sort of? question was, is it like a middleware architecture? Um, yeah, kind of. The thing is that there's sometimes where, actually, let's just take a look at the code. So, it's ironic because I had the compiler open just for this moment. So, this is some of the Webpack source code. Don't be too afraid. It's, it's perfectly fine. But here's a great example. So there are times in which you want to wait for functionality to occur or you want to continue on through certain processes. So if you look, there's actually a couple different types of ways that plugins are, are said to start working. You can see at the top, apply plugins async. There's your event. The second argument is the data that you want to work with. The last argument is the callback function that the plugin will say, hey, I'm done. And then it executes the code wrapped inside. So then, Webpack executes a second event that's called compile. But this is synchronous. This is just a signal to a plugin user that, hey, we're about to do this thing. So go ahead and do whatever you'd like. And then, we have apply plugins parallel. So this is also async, but it has a slightly different way of executing. And, but you can still see that it is asynchronous because the last argument is a function that's actually triggered from the plugin. Yes? Oh, to turn on watch? Okay, so npm run dev will give you watch mode. It didn't work? Uh-oh. How about this? If you run, uh, I have, we can shim it. So let's jump back to our library. So if you're having trouble running watch, you can try doing npm run build dash dash space dash dash watch. And this should be watch, but f uh, instead of dev server, we're just doing webpack in build mode, but it's watching. That, that work? Thank you for clarifying that. Yes? Say it again. Those of us that don't like callbacks, um, sorry, those of us who don't like callbacks, is there a monkey patch for uh, promises instead? Uh, so the monkey patch, okay, so two questions. One is, Sean, how the hell do I know what all these events are and where do I find them? So this, this project, this reason that I did this talk is also kind of dual purpose. So 
This repo is not fully complete, but I plan on having every single hook that is possible, not only in here, but then we're gonna take this and send it to our Webpack doc team, or docs team, and we're gonna add every single plugin hook and give purposes on what they're supposed to do. Um, but there's actually a link in our old documentation that will show you how to find most of the hooks that are, let's say, relevant to you. So you can go to, I think you can just Google Webpack Plugin API. And this first hit will contain information on kind of how to write a plugin, but then also kind of gives you information about a sync hook, async, parallel, handlers are invoked parallel and then some that handle return values, but then you'll also get almost every instance and then every event that you can plug into. So run, the data it passes back, and then kind of some additional useful information to you. This we're still working on copying over to our new docs page. So uh, I w this is something that I always use myself um, and there's all sorts of useful information, especially since you can plug into the parser and you can actually listen to any time a certain syntax or symbol is called. You can modify it. If somebody uses an eval, you can say, don't do that, and you can kill your build. So when I said that any, everything that we've gone through in the life cycle is possible to write a plugin for, you can do it. Uh, so this is a great list to work with. Uh, it's incomplete and, uh, you know, this is going to be one of the biggest projects that our doc team will work on and I will definitely be involved in trying to make sure that we fit all the pieces together. So, we got another question in the back. Shelf. Why don't we go ahead and reset our, uh, reset our, our git here, our, our changes, and why don't we go to 1.2. Hey, Sean. I heard we somebody got a call question. my name. I'm over here with the mic. There's a question. Oh, hey, hey, hey. What's up? Ask a question. Um, so, when you run npm run build, it runs uh, Webpack, yep. and then Webpack runs the run uh, event. It does. How how does that mapping happen when you run? How does the npm script and then? Oh, say that last thing again. How does like, the npm script map to like run or watch run? Where is that distinction happening? It doesn't. Uh, so we can. Act, I'll show you in the compiler uh, code itself. So. If we look inside of the compiler.js in our Webpack source, we can actually scroll all the way up to, well, so this is what I like to do, and this is what I recommend as a trick or a tip, is that I just like to search for a string that matches the hook, so run. So dot run is actually what you would use if you use the node API, or if you look in our binary executable or our bin command, so webpack.js under bin, you're actually gonna find dot run. So that method is called, uh, let me make that bigger, I'm sorry. Dot run, <laughs> dot run is called. And inside the compiler, I like to just search for the hook because it's so much easier um, and you're not, you know, you don't have to concern yourself with any other parts. And here we go, apply plugins async run. Does that kind of answer your question? And we'll also look for run wa or watch run. So, hey, watch run, look. And like I said, they're two separate instances, so it's called watching. But there it is, compiler, apply plugins async. If you really wanted to be brave and search throughout the entire Webpack source, just search this. and you can find all of the hooks that exist. I said templates, I said module factories, uh, parser plugins. Everything in Webpack is a plugin, almost. I think I have a star, I should have put a star, but almost everything is a plugin. And um, it's part of that modular architecture. Even, so when I said there's a parser plugin, that plugin's specific purpose is to listen for a certain type of uh, AST like an import statement. So if there's a new feature that comes out from TC39, those guys are like, we're doing this now. Well, all we have to do in Webpack is rip out a plugin and put a new plugin in. 
It's that simple. So let's jump back to, uh, so I think we're going to do get reset here and jump to the next lesson. If you have questions, like write them down or get ready to like spam me on Twitter. It doesn't matter. So get checkout 1.2. Let's see what's changed. I should check first, but it's okay. I'm pretty sure I remember exactly what changed here. And it's because we jumped the gun, but yes, so you can pass an array as an event, with multiple events if you want to, instead of just a single event. So now uh, let's go ahead and check out 1.3. So get check out 1.3. What do we have here? Oh, okay, so I wanted to slim it down so that you can kind of take this in and look at it one more time before we dive a little bit deeper, I give you a quiz. So in review, I feel like a teacher. <laughs> okay, in review, the main principles of a Webpack plugin are, they are instantiable, so it's a class that implements an apply method and the argument inside of here is going to give back something that you can plug into. In 90% of the cases, it's the compiler. And then to actually plug into something, we call dot plugin, just like node uh, event emitters dot on. We have the event name. And then you're either going to get data or a callback if it's asynchronous. And at the, so like the number one, so if you, well, and then uh, at the end, if it is asynchronous, you call callback. Now you might say like, Sean, what if I forget to hit, to put in callback? So let's just see what happens. Uh, this has caught me up a bajillion times. So let's just run the build and, you know, we never call back. But, oh, I forgot to save. So you see an event and you see a console log, but you don't see anything else. So the build just never happens. Webpack will just fail. This is something, if you would like to put a PR in for this, it would be an awesome PR. Um, yeah, like, hey, you forgot to call back something. I think once we implement things like promises where uncaught promises should fail and, uh, in Node 7, that would be awesome. But yeah, so... Just make sure that if you come across a situation where you don't see your builds, if you're creating a custom plugin, you just want to make sure that you add that callback. Yeah, easy, easy to fix. So let's go ahead and I want you guys to try the quiz. So let's go to Git, check out, or let me just make sure I know the tag name. Okay, so Git, reset, just in case. So we're going to go to quiz. Don't look at that answer yet. Get check out one point quiz. Cool. All right, guys, I'm going to give you just a moment or a few moments. So here we go. I know this is kind of hard to read on the big screen, so I'll just uh, re read it out loud. So your, uh, your goal is to, in the plugin that you have, pass an option called message into your plugin and then use that message property to console log the message when Webpack starts to run or run watch. It's your choice. It could be either or. So go ahead and everybody start and do that right now. <laughs> and if you want help, just raise your hand. <clears throat> yes. Yes. When we can see the web page. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example when when will I have to use this feature? I mean when will I have to, to actually edit the web page plugin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like uh, there's uh, a lot of times I sell, I tell people you never really know when you're gonna need a plugin until it happens. But when you do, you know you actually need to configure or you need to have a custom use case. Um, but I would say that there's lots of different scenarios. Like let's say if you wanted to use a different styling syntax or you want to use a completely different 
let's say you want to build multiple apps, or you want to, like, here's a good example. Um, you want to add different plugins from the community. Let's say you have some tools like Bugsnag or Sentry. I believe each of them also publish Webpack plugins to upload your source maps automatically. So there's a decent example of where you want to add an extra plugin, or let's say you want to use Moment.js or Lodash or something like that. To really optimize them, you want to add some additional Webpack plugins to prune out extra um, loosey-goosey style um, dependencies from, from the libraries. And then when it comes to custom plugins, uh, to me, I've found that if a plugin doesn't already exist out there, which hopefully it should, what you do walk away with is understanding how to debug and um, to debug and then also even contribute if you'd like. And so, uh, but to me, I always end up writing a plugin in the end, in no matter what project. But there's also a, another syntax that you can use that you don't even have to write an extra file, you can do it right in the configuration. Sean, we have another question over here, and okay. then there's one over there next. Awesome. I was curious, um, on the plugin method, yes. when you can send an array of run, run watch, yeah. um, does the code inside get to know which one happened? So when it hits run, does the code inside get that? Does it know that it, it triggered an event of run happened, not an event of run watch? Or watch so run? I'd be lying if I just gave you an answer right now, because I'm not 100% sure. So but we can use the debugger to just look and find out. I don't think so, but let's find out. So, I don't think so, no. So that's a good question though. So it's like, when should I be doing this? When you wanna have the same functionality, but you don't need to know the difference to branch. So like, it's not really as much as a, like optimization having to plug into multiple things. It's more about being able to just apply the same functionality to each, to each hook. Uh, who else needed some, some, some help? <sighs> Yes. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. That's good. Who, who needs help getting the answer to the quiz or working on it? Oh, you guys seem pretty confident. Okay. Oh, yeah. So this right here just console logs a message itself. Right. But what you want to do is be able to pass an argument into this plugin. So jump into your configuration. And just like any class, if you wanted to apply some sort of argument, you could pass it in right here. So you could just put whatever message you'd like. And then go ahead and save that. And let's configure your class or your plugin. So jump to that basic and then go ahead and add that argument into your constructor. So that's what takes arguments and assigns properties to your actual class instance. So you can call it like message, and then let's just say inside of it, this dot message equals message. Yep, that's correct. So you can say something like this dot message, so we're gonna add a property on the instance. And then you can equal it to the message you got from the argument. And then you can go ahead and uh, inside of here, I believe you'll have access now to this dot message. And then you want to make sure and call back after, but I believe, uh, so you'll console log that value, and that should work. I should try it myself. I should try this quiz myself. 
I know it'll work. Oh yeah. <laughs> I have my surface here. Um, I just don't know if I have a connector. Uh, okay, so yeah. Let's try and do it together. Hold on one moment. Let's put me to the test. All right, guys. So we're working with a class and like in JavaScript, who is comfortable using classes in JavaScript? Yeah, most of us. Cool. So how do we pass an argument to a class? Where does it come from? The constructor. So let's just pass a single argument. Because we want to pass this option from our configuration, right? And so we still need to assign this to the class instance somehow. So we could say this.message equals message. OK. Now, so I don't want to look stupid, and I don't want it to error in front of me just automatically. So I just want to be careful. And I'm just going to run npm run debug. Let's just make sure everything's in scope. So OK. So what's on our this instance? Undefined. What? What? Is this because we're in an arrow function? Is it? Oh, that's good. Nice, guys. Look. Pass an option into your plugin. OK. So let's jump out. Is, this, is he scripting? Is, there, is this for real? You'll never know. That's right, so we actually want to pass that fancy message. OK, cool. Oh, no, no semicolons in the array. OK, so let's try it again. npm run debug. All right, what happens? This is called debug-driven development. <laughs> like, seriously, this is, OK. Yeah, it's, I love it. Um, OK, th what? I wonder. Oh, well, we have this.message equals message, but I wonder, is it in scope? Huh? Wow, interesting. Hmm. Well, let's just, let's, let's, I, I'm going to put myself out there. Let's just give it a try. Okay. I swear he's not kidding. Okay, let's just console log it. Let's see what happens. Console.log this dot message plus please don't fail <laughs> okay oh. oh oh how many of you guys wrote your first plug in today just right there with that quiz Congratulations. Act, what, uh, right, right, right. This is a little cumbersome. I understand. You know, we, we need people like yourselves who are pragmatic and intelligent and creative thinkers to help us, you know, innovate this. Um, I know that this is kind of a cumbersome process. And, um, you know, I, I, but we believe, you know, our source code is super modular. And you can learn so much just by reading those plugins themselves. To, to create other plugins. So how many of you got kind of that answer for your quiz? Nice. Good for you guys. Pat on the back. Good. So I want to take it just a little bit further. But I think instead of you know making those who have been sitting around waiting for that special thing I promised them, um, I want to, I'll spend some time just, uh, let's say, with the last 15 minutes to, to help you guys out individually or if you want to learn more about writing plugins or how to do things we can we can do it you know kind of in closed quarters I guess so why don't we let's reset what we had good job guys for passing the quiz and let's just get a little bit more serious so we'll get reset hard okay so let's check out I think we're just going to jump to two so let's go to git checkout 2.0 Whoa, what do we have here? Oh, so I, so I would recommend playing around in this repo and experimenting all the git tags. So I forgot that this one is where I started adding JS doc annotations 
to essentially everything that each of these hooks and the instances do. So I'm not gonna try and read script by script uh, you know, from these comments, but it's kind of just in relation to where we last left off. So we can jump to 2.1. That is reorder, oh, I'm sorry, 2.2. Now let's see what we have here. Whoa, I see another plugin. Okay. So we have our basic one. We're gonna leave that and you know, be proud of our work that we've done. And now we have a couple more interesting hooks. Um, and so let's take a look. So I've added some comments. I hope they don't make your eyes glaze over too much. Um, I wonder if maybe lightening the theme would help, but I guess for right now we'll, we'll just hang out. Um, so, we're still passing an argument in, that's great. But then we also have some more hooks here. So what are these? What are their purpose, Sean? I don't understand, and that's okay. We're gonna help, I'm gonna help you through it. So, we have before run. Do you wanna do something before the run process actually happens? Do you wanna like move a file? Do you wanna do anything you want? You know, uh, you know even crazier, do you wanna hit an API and get some dynamic information? that you need for each build. You can do that. The sky's the limits. Um, and so I'm just hitting a console log here. Let's go ahead and talk about invalid. Oh, what's this? So whenever a file changes, you might have seen before in Webpack it says the bundle has invalidated. And you're like, what? Well, invalid is the actual event that is emitted, and you actually get some interesting information. You get the file that has changed and that caused the rebuild, and then you also get the time it has changed. You might not always find a use case for each of these hooks, but I just want to give you an example of some of the arguments and properties that might come through them. And you see here, this is a synchronous hook, and so you're not, getting, you're not going to get a callback, and one's not going to be called. And then we have our quintessential run and one run watch. And then we also have some more interesting ones like failed and emit and done. So failed is pretty self-explanatory when Webpack melts and has a volcano fire. Or, you know, you guys have seen the stack traces. Uh, let's say you want to plug into it and report some information or log, sys, you know, log something to your enterprise analytics system. You could do so right from here. Uh, and you just trigger the callback. Uh, or I'm sorry, no, that one isn't uh, asynchronous. And then finally, we have things like emit and done. So emit is when Webpack is just about to create those bundles. So the dependency graph is rendered, everything uh, is all sealed up into place, and it's about to shoot, you know, uh, throw files out at you at the output path. Well, Sean, what if, is it a way to add a custom file made up of every other dependency reversed in a markdown file. Yes, you would do so in the submit hook. Um, you can actually access what's called the compilation, which has a property called assets. Why don't we look inside? Debug driven development. Or dev tools driven development, whatever. That sounds uh, less hacky, I guess. Okay, cool, so what do we have inside of here? This is how you want to explore, at least this is how I recommend exploring. There is a property called assets which actually tells you exactly what file is going to be emitted and its file name. So if you wanted to add something to this, you can do so by adding a property to this assets file. Very cool, and you have so much information inside of here in the compilation, um, you know, I don't want to go through too much of it, but there's modules like, oh, tell me all those modules. There's your module factory. There's uh, the result of your module factory if you want to take a look real quick. Hey, Sean, we have a question when you're ready. Yes. What would be the right event to plug into if you want to add assets? Yeah, so if you wanted to add assets, that emit uh, hook is the perfect plugin. I did it in like, it, I'm adding a JavaScript asset, and it won't run it through the uglified JS in my production build. Hmm. Or add the hash. So I'm trying to figure out if there's an earlier Before step. Before or after. So you actually want that file to also be uglified. Just I want it to run through all the other plugins. Okay. 
Oh, that. so like kind of like a custom dependency? So you want it to be bundled and treated as a part of the dependency yes. graph? Yes. Is it just like a flat file? Or it's just a f I'm concatenating my libraries in a it's an app that I can't import my libraries using the Webpack bundle. It won't work right okay. now. So I'm just need to I I'm I was transitioning from a gulp build which was just like concatting all my files together. Uh -huh. I have all my app code working with modules right now, but I still need to just concat all my libraries together. Sure. Okay. So So I have a plugin that does that. <laughs> it just doesn't get uglified unless I do it myself, which I did do, but Well, I guess it would help just to look at the uglify plugin, right? And see what it hooks into. Maybe it's just happening just before. It looks like I think uglify it plugs into optimize. Uglify, so it plugs into the compilation and build module and oh, let's scroll down. There's a lot of source code here. So what happens at build module, right? Optimize chunk assets. So this should happen before emit. So I wonder if it's actually happening before uh, the emit hook, because it needs to optimize your app. So it, opti it has to optimize before emit, I think, right? Yep. So ha is there? A, uh, what I'm wondering is an event that happens before that, and I can't find it. Let's let's I look like and look see. The docs. We can let's search. This is the this is the right way to go about it. So optimize chunk assets. Uh, let's spell it right. Optimize chunk assets. Okay, so there are a couple plugins that are plugged into it, but what we want to look for is apply plugins. So this is in the compilation in what we call the seal phase. So one option is, so what I like to look for is the things that are passed back to you to see if it's possible. So additional assets, but additional chunk assets might be possible. Um, record. I can feel, to, so the original author is named Tobias Coppers. I can feel Tobias saying, Sean, it's this hook. But it's easier just to look with you guys. Uh, emit. So let's find out where the emit hook actually happens. So that's on the compiler. What if we added it to self So you should be able to add it anywhere that the compilation is provided to you. So you could add it as early as far back as. You could actually add it in the compilation hook. Um, let's see, compilation. You could add it here if it doesn't rely on really, if it's not added to the dependency graph, but you really just want to minify it. You could add it this early to assets. I believe the property might exist. And if it doesn't, then we should take a look at it together and hack away. Okay, so it's been 40 minutes. All right, guys. So first of all, I really appreciate you guys sitting through here this long. And I want to take the last 20 minutes, uh, you know, to either... To anybody who wants to come up and work with me on a plugin specific, are there any other questions? One so more, hold on before you leave. Now this is for you guys only who actually stayed here, uh, you know, this long. So I appreciate it. Um, I I have just a couple more slides, and that was to answer Mike's question. Um, but really, anybody who has stayed here this long can actually go into the swag room and say that Sean said that I can have a Webpack t-shirt and you will receive one. <laughs> now let me finish this section, no. <laughs> okay, uh, so we don't run out of time and you guys have done an incredible job and if this doesn't make sense to you still, I'm still as far away as a, as a tweet or a direct message. And so, I mean, like I said, one of the motivations was to get people involved. Um, you know, I want you guys to have a t-shirt to be proud and to know that at any time, if you have zero commits, if you have a thousand commit history of open source work, that you are always welcome to help us at Webpack. And so if you want to just learn more about Webpack, 
uh, I always have a few things that I, so Webpack from First Principles. If this like totally made no sense to you and like, Sean, I regret this. <laughs> I just want to learn about Webpack. Go here. Um, or go to our, our docs page, webpack.js.org slash concepts. And Sean, I want to get involved. Your passion has ignited a fire in my heart. It doesn't always happen. <laughs> okay, so you can do all sorts of things. Like I said, there's always a place. So you can triage your issues. You can work on Webpack and Trib. We need help there standardizing. You can contribute to our new documentation. And there is everything you can see there from Webpack and Trib and more. There's lots more repos since I've created the slide. Just use Webpack 2 and write some custom plugins. Or, I know this doesn't really count for you guys, but boy, those other guys are going to be like, I wish I would have gotten a shirt. Well, they can still buy a shirt by going to webpack.threadless.com. This actually, all the funds go directly towards our open source, or our open collective. And so like I said, all the work that the core team does is on our free time. Um, and since we've started this, we have had an outpour of support from people to be able to help sponsor and back us. And so um, if you want to help shape the future and be a shareholder for Webpack and literally have an impact and say on changing our direction, besides just being a user, go to opencollective.com slash Webpack and donate. Or just come find me. And like literally I say gripes, frustrations, concerns, you should be like, Sean, never do this talk again. <laughs> I understand. Um, we want to hear this because you guys, like I said, make our community possible. Uh, it's the reason why we have been successful today because you guys use Webpack. And so every, every problem that you have is equally as important as the most important feature that we have to implement. So like I said, Webpack is built by you and to be code of conduct safe, we give a crap. So thank you guys so much. <laughs>